Hello, it's Scott Manley here. And last night, I went to see Apollo 11 in IMAX. And right away, if you are a space nerd, you have to go and see this and you have to go and see it on the biggest screen possible. If you're even a fan of documentaries, and I'm going to say the last year has had a lot of amazing documentaries, this really stands up there with those. Although it is a very pure telling of the Apollo 11 story, I'm going to say. So the director is Todd Douglas Miller, who's made a couple of movies prior to this, and he'd made something about the last steps on the moon. But he was convinced to make a movie about Apollo 11 for the 50th anniversary and got in touch with his buddies at the National Archives and Records Administration. That is where the US government collects recordings and movies and things like that that the US government has paid for. So apparently what happened was they were asking for basically everything Apollo 11. And their guy there, Dan Rooney, said, oh yeah, I've got these like 65 millimeter Panavision film reels in the back. Nobody's ever looked at them and we can't transfer them. Uh, they had like 168 reels of film in this super high quality format. Basically the 1960s version of IMAX covering Apollo 8 through Apollo 13. Uh, this was to make a movie called Moonwalk 1. It was a collaboration with MGM Studios who kind of stepped away from the deal like about a month before the Apollo 11 launch. launch. The movie was eventually released in 1972, but it completely disappeared. Nobody was interested because the Apollo had kind of come and gone and people were getting jaded. Um, but that being said, it is a bit of a cult movie. So yeah, this film had, most of this film had never been seen before. It was of a quality above almost anything else that was available. And yeah, the NRA didn't have, uh, N N A R A, not the NRA, they didn't have the footage to try, the hardware to transfer this. And so they were quite happy that a documentary filmmaker was willing to spend time getting all this stuff digitized so that they could be shared more easily with future generations. So the documentary itself is a very linear retelling of the story. It's a very linear document. There's no pe there's no stepping out of time with modern interviews with talking you know, people talking about the history. There's no interviews with people in the background trying to place this great achievement in historical context. It is just the footage from the era arranged more or less chronologically in order. There's some bits where we take out to, you know, narrate, to provide context. There's a the suiting up scene at the start where we get to see Buzz, Neil, Michael Collins all standing around and getting their suits on. And, you know, that scene, I just wanted to pause and keep looking for more and more details in those suits. But, yeah, I mean, they're quiet. It's not like a movie where it's scripted, where they're making, like, you know, pithy jibes back and forth, you know, to keep the audience interested. It's just very technical going through the paces, making sure that their suits are correctly set up and their biological sensors and everything are all there. But while they're doing this, while Neil is, you know, focusing on the mission ahead, there are there is a slight step out to show photos from his past and put, you know, the the progress or the progression of what it took for Neil and Buzz to get to this uh, point. Yeah, I always think it's interesting that, you know, we think of Neil Armstrong as being this great, you know, space hero. But, you know, on the Apollo 11 mission, he was the mission commander, but he had the least amount of time in space. That was partly because his mission had to be cut short. But on the other hand, he did fly a, a spacecraft that had been had a major technical problem back safely. So he had experience. Regardless, yeah, that is the one real step out in time. The rest of the rest of everything else is told linearly. Uh, there's some moments where they try to explain to the audience who aren't nerds like me exactly what is going on. Very simple linear line animations showing the docking, the landing, the translation, all that stuff. There's a couple of moments with, you know, clocks on the screen, countdowns. There's com captions showing some of the people, uh, like you know, Bruce McCandless as Capcom. Um, the new footage also includes moving the Saturn V out of the vehicle assembly building on the crawler, and we get to see, again, I'm wanting to pause this and zoom in and see all sorts of details I haven't seen. Uh, we get a lot of shots of crowds, of people that had come there from all over the US and all over the world to see this thing 
firsthand. And you've got a whole slice, a whole cross section of society, people of every, you know, every background. You've got like the people sitting around on their beach chairs, drinking beers with their kids. And then you've got, you know, famous politicians and celebrities. You've got Johnny Carson, like famous TV host, kind of walking around, not sure what to do when he's not hosting a TV show. And then uh, what we've obviously got the launch as well. So, I mean, this is a, a really, it was really amazing that they decided to document the people that were coming there. there were lots of, you know, flying shots as well, moving around the launch area. And, and this is, it, it is, boy, I mean, I I want the Blu-ray of this and I'm just going to pause this and rewatch it and rewatch it and rewatch it. <laughs> um most of the audio movie comes from mission control loops. There's something like 11,000 hours because they would record 32 channels of audio simultaneously for the whole mission. And they you know, sifted through that to find some really great moments as well, beyond the obviously important ones. There's uh, some TV interviews as well in there. There's no, yeah, as I said, there's no interviews after the fact. The launch though, I mean, you could say that in special effects, right? <laughs> The Apollo 11 launch is the greatest practical effect because, hey, they were doing it for real, obviously. You know, 3,000 tons of rocket being lifted by 3,500 tons of you know, rocket thrust. And I'm seeing this, I've, I've never seen this quality of footage. You go and see this in IMAX because the sound is great as well. Not just the sound of the engines and the rocket, but the sound of the soundtrack, which is fantastic. Um, the launch is taken largely from a wide angle camera, so we get to see the whole rocket from top to bottom. We're not seeing those super close up shots of the ice falling down. That seem, that's a, a trope that has been overused at this point. And seeing the whole rocket move like that, I've never really seen this at this level of detail. And again, I'm going to pause this and rewind it. You, you get to see the cloud of ice just explode off of the tank as it starts to move. And when it comes up, you know, you can very easily see the transition between the uh, nozzles through the dark film cooling region through the actual, you know, th exhaust. Get to see all that. You, the transition through the, the you're going transonic with the, uh, you know, with the Mach uh, shock rings or whatever going around it. The, yeah, you get to see it all. And holy boy, that's amazing. Once we get to space, we do have to leave the amazing high quality film behind because the, the astronauts weren't carrying that. They were carrying 16 millimeter cameras. They were carrying still cameras. They had a TV camera. They didn't have a high quality Panavision movie camera. And so once it gets to space, the video quality does drop off and there's some moments in the restoration that look a little iffy, like there's digitally added grain that seems to flow around rather than step from one to the frame to the next. Regardless though, I mean, this is definitely the best quality footage I've seen. And when we get to the landing, the landing is also the best I've seen as well. I keep saying this is the best I've seen. It really is the best I've seen. And I'm hoping that we can get this footage for ourselves at some point. So the landing, as you know, when they came down, Neil noticed that they were coming down into a rock field and needed to perform a translation to find a spot to land. And I've never really seen this explained so clearly and not explained by people talking about it, but you see those rocks and you see the altitude and you see the fuel counting down. And it's very obvious when the spacecraft makes this translation across the surface and finally lands. And, and to the point that the person I was with, one of the people I was with, they weren't, they didn't know this story in such great detail, but they were like, wow, she said, I, I never realized that they had done this. So I, I've never seen that so effectively communicated. Oh, we also have like the computer alarms, 1201, 1202 popping up in the corner as well. You, you, we get, of course, the surface excursion. We get all the classic photos, the, the reading of the plaque, the conversation with the president is told via TV. And then we get them coming home. More great footage of the USS Hornet, the recovery, the move into the mobile quarantine facility. And then it's the end credits. And 
again, there's a great narrative that's running through this movie. There's suspense and we know what happens, but it feels suspenseful all the way through. Stay for the end credits because there's even more footage over the end credits as well, including, you know, Neil thanking everyone that was involved for, for letting them out of the <laughs> quarantine facility. The soundtrack, the soundtrack is great. This is a guy by a guy called Matt Morton, who decided to use Moog synthesizers, modular Moog synthesizers, which is just a wall of cables plugging into each other, uh, to make a soundtrack which sounds both space age and yet was using hardware that's contemporaneous to the original Apollo mission. So I felt that was really, really powerful. We had, you know, nice ambience when they were flying through space, when chill things were happening, when times started where the countdown was important, where things had to be executed at the right time. You come up with this great pulsing synth beat that was, you know, impressing upon us the urgency and the importance of these moments. So yeah, Apollo 11, it's on limited release. It's going to get a bigger release, I think, next week. It's going to be in IMAX. It's probably going to be in regular movie theatres. Sound system is really, really important. I think it will also come to, like, uh, you know, uh, museums, but it'll be in a cut-down 40-minute format version as well, which I, I can imagine will really fly by. You know, considering this was a 97-minute movie, the people I was with, they're all like, wow, that felt way faster. And I totally agree. It, like, it just flew by in time. It seemed that they'd gone from being on the Earth to landing on the moon in, in with such urgency. It, <laughs> uh, yeah, it really is fabulous. So I don't know what else to say about it. Go and see Apollo 11. You will love it if you're a fan of space. If you are not a fan of space, you will still be impressed by so much in this movie and, and it will make you feel that humans can accomplish amazing things. And also, of course, we're going to see, you know, SpaceX's DM-1 mission tonight with Ripley flying. It's nice to see this in context and realize that we've got a long way to go before we're back to Apollo. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. <laughs>